Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network. I'm Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii. I'm filling in for Dr. Kedli Iakina. He's the President and CEO. Well, the conflict in Russia and Ukraine has sent oil prices soaring, especially in Hawaii, where gas prices are among the highest in the nation. Many blame those higher prices on the Jones Act, which makes it more expensive to ship in oil from the U.S. mainland. Mainland. On March 3rd, the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii sent a letter to President Joe Biden asking him to grant Hawaii a Jones Act waiver for fuel imports. And on March 8th, U.S. Representative Ed Case also sent a waiver request to the president. Here today from Washington, D.C. to discuss the situation with us is Grassroots Institute scholar and Cato Institute policy analyst Colin Grabau. Aloha, Colin. Aloha. Thanks for having me on the program. So Colin, uh, can you explain this? Uh, well, what is the Jones Act, first of all, and why, it is, why is it an, inch, an issue right now? The Jones Act is a 1920 law that essentially states if you want to transport cargo from one part of the United States to another part of the United States by water, that the vessel used to transport that cargo, be it a ship, a tugboat, basically anything that floats has to meet four conditions. That's that the vessel has to be US flagged and registered, has to be mostly owned by Americans, has to be mostly crewed by Americans, and has to be built in the United States. So what this means is that all foreign ships or even US flagged ships have to be built in another country, which is to say 99% of the ships out there can't be used to transport goods within the United States. So that means less competition, uh, and it, then you, which drives up costs. And then also these Jones Act ships are incredibly expensive to build and significantly more expensive to operate than their foreign counterparts. All that adds up to very high shipping uh, costs. Now you ask, why is it in the news now? Well, Jones Act is in the news lately because the United States has imposed sanctions on purchases of Russian oil. And despite being the world's leading producer of oil, uh, we still import foreign oil to meet our energy needs. And the big picture, including from Russia. Now, in, in the big picture, Russia accounts for just a few percent uh, of our overall oil use. But for Hawaii, it's much more significant. In fact, according to a 2020 report from the Hawaii State Energy Office, um, since 2010, Hawaii has imported the majority of its foreign crude from Indonesia, Libya, and Russia. In fact, in 2019, over 90% of the foreign crude import into Hawaii came from just two countries, Libya and Russia. I think Russia was 30 something percent and Libya was 15 something percent. And then so according now, to Representative Ed Case, go ahead. Why, now, why is that though? Is, why is Hawaii shipping in so much more oil from Russia than the mainland US? Yeah, so that, that's, that's an interesting issue. We produce a lot of oil. Uh, we actually export oil uh, to other countries. In fact, we sent it to China, but we're importing it from Russia. In fact, it, you know, in 2019, Hawaii imported none of its oil from other parts of the United States. You know, why is this? Um, I don't think we can answer that question without talking about the Jones Act. Essentially, once you factor in the cost of using Jones Act compliant ships, it doesn't make sense for Hawaii to buy oil from other parts of the United States. It basically becomes uh, cost prohibitive. And this isn't just, you know, my opinion. There was a 2014 report from something called the Hawaii Refinery Task Force, and they noted the operator of a Hawaii refinery stating that domestic supplies of energy were not competitive in part due to Jones Act restrictions and the cost in using Jones Act compliant ships versus foreign flag ships. So right now uh, we have a situation where Hawaii, they used to, they were, may have been using a lot of Russian oil. They need to find replacements for that oil because they can't use it anymore because of these new sanctions. And basically if they're going to have look abroad into other countries rather than buying from the okay, United so States uh, because the Jones Act basically puts that off the table. This is making the price of our gas higher. I mean, we're already seeing gas um, soaring. That's, um, you know, due to geopolitical factors, but this just makes it higher. So is this Jones Act thing only about gas or does it affect uh, the price of other things in Hawaii too? Well, the Jones Act, by mandating the use of ships that are very expensive to build and operate, impacts the cost of transportation. 
And the clock just transportation impacts basically everything we use because so much of what we use has to be transported to us from wherever it was made. And that's especially true in the case of Hawaii, given its geographic isolation and things have to be transported to it from long distances. So getting shipping that is efficient, as inexpensive as possible is very important for Hawaii. And the Jones Act doesn't provide that. And let me just add here that, you know, when we think of Jones Act making things more expensive, yes, it does mean we go to the store, things cost uh, some percentage more, but it goes beyond just things you get at the store. Remember, we're talking about energy. So that means the thing, the, you know, the energy used to power your car, to heat or to cool your house, although Grand Hawaii have a nice climate, so you don't have to use a, a ton of energy. Um, all that, you know, these Our air conditioners get you all over the place. And, and Hawaiian Electric, yeah. just, uh, Hawaiian Electric's just uh, announced that it was going to increase prices uh, now. So consumers are going to be hit again. Part of that is because of the higher cost of oil. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So why is the shipping, can you explain again in basic terms, why is the Jones Act shipping so much more expensive than shipping with uh, ships that are built overseas? Well, there's a, there's a few factors that go into that. Um, one is just the cost of the ships themselves. As I mentioned earlier, Jones Act ships are very expensive to build. So we're talking about energy. Let's look at tankers. Uh, tankers, uh, what's called a medium range tanker. This is a, one on the smaller end of the scale. Uh, one of those overseas costs about $40 million to build. In the United States, it's a minimum of $150 million to build. So we're talking roughly four times more for the ship. That's, you know, that's, a, that's a difference of a minimum of $110 million that someone has to pay for and you know consumers are going to pay for a lot of that but then after you get the ship itself um you have to crew it with americans american uh unionized crews command much higher wages than what you find in other countries but it also goes beyond that uh also uh if you put your ship under the u.s flag it means for example if you want to repair your ship you repair it in a foreign shipyard you get hit with 50 percent tax um, so this is another cost that American uh, ships have to bear that other uh, you know, foreign shipping does not. So you add all these things together and the end result is very expensive shipping. Well, and the, so it's they're built, they're more expensive to build, they're more expensive to man, but there's also fewer of them too. And doesn't that also uh, raise costs? Well, that's right. There's, as I, you know, right now there are currently 94 Jones Act ships uh, out of, you know, something, something in the neighborhood of uh, 45 to 50,000 ships in the world. So, you know, literally, you know, it's something like uh, point, uh, you know, 1.2% uh, of the ships in the world are available to Americans. You know, 99 point, you know, 8% of the ships are, are off limits, essentially. So you have less competition. That's going to mean, uh, you know, higher prices. And what about uh, for oil? How many of those ships are involved in um, the, the type of ships that would ship oil to Hawaii? So right now there are, I believe, 56 uh, tankers in the Jones Act fleet, ocean going ships. Um, but of those 56, the majority of those are used to transport uh, refined products. We're talking about gasoline, uh, you know, jet fuel, things like that. Uh, there are only, I believe, 11 ships in the Jones Act fleet that are dedicated to transporting oil. And those are mostly used to transport oil from Alaska to refineries on the West Coast. Now, some of you might think, well, why don't you just take some of those uh, tankers that are used for refined products and just fill them with oil. And you can do that. Uh, the only issue is that, you know, you fill a ship full of crude oil, then you want to switch it back to carrying uh, refined products like gasoline. Well, you got to scrub all that crude oil out. And that, that's not easy. And that, and that involves some, some costs. Um, and also those, again, those ships tend to be smaller. Um, and so you fill a smaller vessel with crude. It's not as efficient. So it leads to higher costs as well. I see. Well, uh, President Biden banned the import of Russian oil last week. In, and although even before that, Par Pacific Holdings, which owns Hawaii's only oil refinery, had said it would stop importing Russian oil as soon as the last tankers under contract make it to Hawaii. So how will those uh, actions affect Hawaii of the banning of, of Russian oil imports? And, and how will they affect the entire U.S., including Guam and Puerto Rico? Uh, 
Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Hawaii is in a situation right now where it's been using, you know, Russian crude for something between a quarter and a third of its uh, oil needs. And now that's off the table. It has to look for something else to replace that with. And when Hawaii looks around the world, it basically has to say, well, the U.S. is off the table. We can't really use that. The Jones Act makes that you know, prohibitively expensive. So, you know, when you have fewer options, it's less likely that Hawaii will get the best bargain, will get the best deal, will get the, the, the best deal on, on its energy supplies. And that goes, you know, you mentioned Puerto Rico and Guam. I, I can't speak to Guam as much. I'm not as familiar. But I know that last year, for example, Puerto Rico, they're kind of in the same situation. Um, depending on the month last year, their uh, sourcing from Russia was anything from, I believe, 10 to 30 percent of its petroleum needs came from Russia, which is uh, kind of absurd when you think about the fact that Puerto Rico is next door. It's, it's much closer to the U.S. mainland than Hawaii is, and the U.S. is an energy superpower. But it's, again, like Hawaii, is basically cost prohibitive, so they have to turn to foreign sources. And I, I, I have to stop and, and just remark about the fact that it would be easier and cheaper for Puerto Rico to get energy from the U.S. mainland if it wasn't part of the United States. Being part of the United States actually makes it more difficult and more expensive to get energy um, you know, despite being part of the same country. It's just a very absurd situation that, of course, Hawaii also finds itself in. Well, when you think about the Jones Act, it, it of, often is like looking at economics upside down. It, uh, some things don't seem to make sense. Um, what has been the reaction of pro-Jones Act groups to the waiver requests? And uh, what are they saying? And uh, how would you respond? So last week, uh, a group called the American Maritime Partnership, which is essentially a group that represents companies like Matson and Pasha, which transport, uh, operate ships going to Hawaii. Um, they lobby for the Jones Act. That's what the AMP does. That's, that's literally all they do. They just exist to try to keep the Jones Act in place. They sent a letter, unsurprisingly, to the Biden administration opposing any waiver of the Jones Act, stating that such waivers are unnecessary because currently there are Jones Act compliant tankers available to transport oil and fuel, and waivers would just outsource jobs and undermine national security. But to me, this argument kind of misses the point. The issue isn't so much that there aren't any tankers to be had. It's just that they're so expensive that they make the purchase of U.S. oil and fuel cost prohibitive. Um, I'll point out, by the way, that former Coast Guard Admiral Paul Zukunft, who wrote an op-ed in the Star Advertiser last week praising the Jones Act, uh, well, just a couple of days after publishing that op-ed, he was also quoted in, also in the Star Advertiser saying that a Jones Act exemption for Hawaii um, so they could buy U.S. fuel, well, that might be sensible. So it seems that not even some pro-Jones Act folks are completely buying the argument that the American Maritime Partnership is, is offering. That's interesting. And the Jones Act has been waived in the past for national defense or emergencies or shortages. Uh, is that correct? It has. Uh, we do have uh, past examples. Uh, so most recently was last year um, when the colonial pipe during the colonial pipeline outage and uh, that pipeline was shut down that runs along the East Coast. So there was a need to find alternative methods of, of moving fuel to where it's needed. Uh, there were two waivers issued. Now, these were not broad waivers. These were for specific ships. Uh, basically, companies applied for permission. They said, please, can we use a foreign ship to move this fuel from the Gulf Coast up to different points along the East Coast to where it's needed? And for, for two ships, there were waivers granted. Uh, before that, back in 2017, there was a 10-day waiver of the Jones Act issued for anyone uh, transporting goods uh, to Puerto Rico. This is in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Maria that hit in September of 2017. Um, and uh, before that, you find other examples of natural disasters. Um, there are some hurricanes that hit uh, Texas that same year, uh, Hurricane Sandy that hit uh, the New York, New Jersey area. Um, about a decade so ago. It's, it's so, often waived. And, and uh, so chances may be uh, positive for of a waiver now, but um, we have a view, viewer question that came in. Uh, he asks, the, the process to request a Jones Act waiver supposedly takes a long time. Did either the Grassroot Institute or Representative Case invoke this process or 
is there some procedure available to bypass all of this? So, um, so what's the best way to get a waiver request through? So there, there are two ways of, of, of getting a waiver. One way is if the Secretary of Defense uh, requests a waiver for the Jones Act, it's automatically granted. The, the issue with that path is that it has to be, according to the law, in direct support of military operations. So that's a pretty high bar to clear. Uh, the other path to getting a waiver is someone such as you know, the Grassroot Institute or anybody can request a waiver and say, I want to move this from point A to point B. I need a foreign ship to do it. Um, well, two things. It has to be on national security grounds. You have to uh, prove that this supports national security. And also the U.S. Maritime Administration does a survey of all the ships out there, and they have to conclude that you're right, there are no American ships capable of doing this. So you have to meet kind of those, those two criteria in order to secure a waiver through that route. I see. Um, well, but there's also the option of Congress doing something or the president doing something. Is that right? Well, Congress can, yes. Uh, Congress, if they uh, pass a waiver, um, yes, they, there is no national security standard that has to be met. You know, Congress can can do whatever it wants and, and can have the waiver as broad as it wants. Unfortunately, the the the, um, the president can't issue a waiver. The president can can request can you know kindly ask the Secretary of Defense to ask for a waiver, but the president himself does not. Have have that authority. So again, the, the two methods are Secretary of Defense, which is part of the executive branch, and then also other people can request a waiver, uh, provided that it, uh, there are no ships available and it's in the interest of national security. I see. Well, um, I want to also ask about some of the um, some more objections that we've heard to waivers and and this whole process. Um, I mean, one objection is wouldn't waivers only benefit the oil companies? Okay, you get a Jones Act waiver, it's easier to ship oil around, but are we really gonna see that at the pump? Well, I, I think that you know there are many factors that affect the, the cost of, of gas and what you pay at the pump. Transportation is one of them. In a competitive market, um, I have to think that lower costs translate uh, down to the consumer, um, because if you just tried to keep those profits for yourself, someone else would come in and undercut you. So I don't think that maybe you can find short term examples of that. But in the longer term, I, I th think that, you know, in a competitive marketplace, the, the, the lower costs ultimately translate into lower prices that benefit consumers. Right. The market has a way of um, of getting profits actually to the consumer <laughs> in a way, um, as long as there's enough competition. Yes. Um, what about the strategic petroleum reserve? We've heard a lot about Biden um, releasing the strategic so 30 million barrels from the strategic petroleum reserve. Um, would we need a Jones Act waiver for that? There have been uh, waivers in the past. For, for the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve and for the transportation of that uh, petroleum to where it's needed. Um, I, I, I think it's unlikely we'll get one this time uh, because again, last I checked, uh, there were a few Jones Act tankers available. And I think that the Biden administration, which is strongly supportive of the Jones Act, the last thing they're gonna do is uh, waive it unless they absolutely have to, unless there's no alternative. And I don't think we've quite reached that point yet. And I just haven't seen any indication from the, from the administration uh, indicating an interest in waiving the Jones Act for, for that purpose. Another uh, question from a viewer. What about the president granting a waiver through executive order? Uh, I, I, I am not. I I am not familiar with that any uh, waiver being granted uh, by executive order. Um, you know, as far as I know, the only two uh, waivers you can obtain are through the two methods that. that paths that I mentioned earlier. So uh, I'm, I'm certainly I'm not aware of that ever uh, occurring. I see. I, I did some research into whether um, the president has ever done an executive order to waive the Jones Act. And it seems like something may have been done uh, during Pearl Harbor, but I'll have to look at that more. Um, in any case, what would you say about the well, national... We Go ahead. Do you know, we, yeah. No, I was just going to say, of course, we ended up waiving, uh, suspending the Jones Act during World War II.
I see. Yes. And and uh, what about the national defense argument now that we're on this topic? I mean, uh, what about those that say but we need the Jones Act for national defense. I mean, uh, we've got a conflict in Russia and Ukraine. Some say that we need the Jones Act more than ever now. Yes, we do hear those kinds of arguments. I think if we look at the issue just strictly in the context of energy, because that's what we're talking about right now with the Jones Act, um, the national security argument plainly doesn't make sense as the Jones Act is literally a big reason why Hawaii has found itself dependent on Russian oil and sourcing it from there instead of the US mainland. Let's remember the Jones Act is basically a tax on domestic commerce. If you import something from abroad, it's not subject to the Jones Act. It just makes it more expensive for Americans to do business with each other and trade with each other. Um, so you know, it's a disincentive to domestic supply chains. Uh, how is that good for national security? But in fairness to Jones Act supporters, you know, we should look at the argument more broadly. Uh, supporters typically argue that the Jones Act means the United States has robust shipping because you, know, you can only use American ships. And it means we have lots of shipbuilding because those ships have to be built in the United States. And it means that we have mariners in time of war that can crew uh, uh, ships for sea lift purposes. Well, you know, that's the theory, but I don't think it holds up to scrutiny. Uh, U.S. shipbuilding is so expensive and uncompetitive. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, $40 million for a tanker versus $150 million for a tanker. There isn't much demand for it. Last year, there were literally zero Jones Act ocean-going ships delivered. In the entire country, there are only two ships under construction. These are two ships for Pasha that were supposed to be delivered in 2020, but still haven't been delivered yet. Um, and then there also aren't that many, very many Jones Act ships out there, just 94, as I mentioned earlier. And in wartime, it would be difficult to use those ships because if you take those ships and the military uses them, well, who's going to transport goods to Hawaii or Puerto Rico or other parts of the United States? And then as far as mariners, there was a 2017 government study that concluded we're about 1,800 mariners short in a best case scenario to crew our ships in time of war. Um, and you know, it turns out that forcing U.S. ship operators to pay four to five times more for new ships is a pretty poor way of trying to promote the domestic maritime industry. But you know, let's set all that aside for a minute. Beyond not working, the Jones Act just isn't fair in a national security context. If the idea is to provide national security for all Americans, they should be paid for by all Americans. Right now, we have a very small percentage of Americans, those live in Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico, Guam, they're paying a wildly disproportionate part of the bill to keep these U.S. ships, mariners, and shipyards in operation. You know, that's not right. If we need ships and mariners for national security to be paid for by, you know, direct subsidies funded by all Americans from our taxes. We shouldn't just have a sm very small percentage of Americans foot the bill if this is really all about national security. We had another uh, comment come in. The American Maritime Partnership in its statement to the president also said a waiver would benefit only oil traders, not the American consumer. Um, I, I, we might have covered that, but uh, what do you think about that statement? Uh, again, I think that uh, I think in a very, very short term, that might be true. You can think of scenarios where um, you have a high price of oil and someone can get a, a, a foreign ship and then take advantage of the lower costs and pocket that difference. But as, as more and more people enter that market and try to take advantage of it, you're going to see that premium decrease. And again, a competitive marketplace, ultimately, it's going to drive down prices and consumers will benefit. U.S. Representative Ed Case of Hawaii has asked the president for a waiver as well as the Grassroot Institute. Uh, now, what are the chances, do you think, that the Jones Act would actually be waived for fuel imports? Right now, uh, I'll be surprised if it happens. Um, the Biden administration, as I mentioned previously, they strongly there's a lot of support in Congress, including from the other three members of Hawaii's congressional delegation. You know, I think it would be a more powerful signal if Hawaii's congressional delegation in unison uh, made this request. Um, but unfortunately, Ed Case is kind of the lone wolf uh, on, on this issue, the lone ranger, I should say. Um, so unfortunately, I, I think the power of special interests will triumph over what's best for Americans and, and the residents of Hawaii in particular. Uh, well, 
that was quite a whirlwind romp through the uh, Jones Act landscape right now. But I wanted to uh, make sure we our viewers knew who you were. <laughs> so now at the end of the program, I want to just talk a little bit about your background. Uh, uh, again, Colin is a grassroots scholar and a Cato Institute policy analyst. Uh, but yeah, what, what's your background and interest in the Jones Act, too? Well, um... I started at Cato in September of 2017, and that is when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. In fact, I believe the first op-ed I ever wrote for Cato was about the Jones Act in the wake of Hurricane Maria and the need to lift it so we could get relief to Puerto Rico as, as quickly as possible. And when you first read about the Jones Act, it seems like a pretty straightforward law. You know, ships have to meet those four conditions. And, and, and that's it. But when you really start to dig deeper into the law and really try to make sense of it and assess, does this law make sense? Is this a good law? Um, it just takes you down this rabbit hole that uh, it, it's fascinating. Uh, it's disturbing uh, just how badly Americans have been led astray and, and some of the, the poor arguments behind it. So here I am years later and I'm still uh, looking at the Jones Act and, and looking at all the different ways that it hurts this country. Uh, it's definitely a rabbit hole type of uh, policy issue. Um, but what would you want our viewers to walk away with um, from this discussion? Well, I just want them to walk away with uh, uh, perhaps a few lessons. One here is, you know, we're talking about the Jones Act because, um, you know, Hawaii is importing or has been importing so much Russian oil. But if this crisis didn't come up, I think most people in Hawaii, certainly most Americans, and I assume not even most people in Hawaii would be aware of that fact. So we're aware of that fact because it's in the spotlight. But I think it's, it's, it's good to step back for a minute and think about all the other ways that the Jones Act impacts life in Hawaii and, and hurts the residents of Hawaii. Um, you know, again, it's, it's the things you buy in the store. It's the energy that powers your home, powers your car. Uh, it's the price of jet fuel at the airport. Um, all these things uh, come together. The uh, businesses in Hawaii are less competitive. Uh, I know the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii has given the example before of Kaloa Rum. They get hurt by the Jones Act because they have to import bottles and labels and things like that mm -hmm. from the mainland. They have to pay more. And if they want to ship it back to the mainland, they got to pay more too. That means they're less competitive. That means fewer jobs. So it, it hurts uh, Americans in, in a myriad of ways. Well, and bottom line, it makes... Uh... Hawaii's cost of living more expensive. So thanks so much to Colin Grabo, a Grassroot Institute scholar and Cato Institute policy analyst. And thank you for watching a, uh, Hawaii Together.